get back It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, Today, our sponsor is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only. Today we have Wade. I'm really excited. It's been a long time since we've chatted. We have Wade Foster, co-founder of Zapier. And Zapier gives you internet automation superpowers. And it does this by making it easy to get your web apps to talk to each other. And I'll give you an example. So I use Zapier in two ways. One, someone fills out our Typeform application in Rise25, and it automatically imports that into Infusionsoft so we can make sure to stay in touch with people. Also, for Inspired Insider, for this, I use it when blog post gets published, it automatically posts the link on Twitter and Facebook. So my tagline, Wade for Zapier is it's like having a virtual staff member focused on automation for a fraction of the price. So that's my personal tagline. And Zapier went from zero to over 1.4 million users and grew to 50 staff in five years. Wade, thank you for joining me. Yeah, I'm excited to be here, Jeremy. Thanks for a wonderful intro. (laughs) Yeah, that's my favorite tagline. Feel free to steal it. Yeah, Um, that's great. I love it. (laughs) You know, you've been interviewed a lot. You've talked a lot. Your blog is awesome. You know, I suggest anyone go on and check out uh, the blog on Zapier. But I want to start off with the mindset growing up in Missouri Mm -hmm. and how the saxophone influenced that ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Take me back to Missouri. Yeah, so I grew up in a in a conservative you know town in Missouri, Jeff City. It's a capital of Missouri. It's you know um, everyone there like the the the, my, the majority employer there is um, state government, right? Um, so I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, so the you know that's the capital of the the state, and so there's not you know people who work for the state government tend to think about you know employment as you know what's going to get you a good salary with good benefits and going to be able to take care of the families you know sure. that's the mindset of yeah. most of the folks there which is a good path for a lot of people um but it, there's not a lot of entrepreneurship that's yeah. not really a thing that happens much uh, in, in that city that's a different mindset that's not rep- very well represented there yeah and so growing up i didn't really have much of that exposure. I, I kind of just did, um, you know, went to school, got good grades, did what I was told, you know, I was like, here, this is the path that's going to get you a good job and, you know, benefits and, you know, the things that you need, right? What did your so parents was, do when you were growing um, up? So my mom is a pharmacist and my dad worked for the state for a long time. Mm-hmm. And then he actually did try his own thing. At a, he, he did try have his own business, but that was later on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I, when I'm growing up, though, I, I he worked for the state was what I, I remembered. Yeah. Um, and my first real exposure to anything that was kind of different than that was um, with the saxophone. So yeah. I, I I started playing in fifth grade. Um, I really took to it. I liked doing it a lot. Um, it was it was a lot of fun. You know, got I started playing jazz music, which I really enjoyed that because it's more creative. Um, you get to, you get to solo and improvise and things like that, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and my instructor at the time, um, realized that, you know, I, I was enjoying this and I was doing well at this and I was, I think I was putting more effort into a lot of his than a lot of his students. And so they had a, um, a saxophone quartet where they had a, a membership slot opened up and, he started inviting me to sub for that group and Mm. like, you know, occasionally do a gig or two, I think kind of trying it out to see if I could like handle playing with them. Right. Um, and so I did a couple rehearsals and I was like, for me, I was in, I think I was ninth grade at this time. So for me, this was super cool because I was playing with like what I thought were basically professional musicians. That's what I, you're getting paid. You're professional, right? (laughs) Yeah. I I wasn't getting paid yet, but like, that was, that's around the corner here. Um, 
And so I, I guess I passed the, you know, whatever test they had, right? It was like, you know, I was, you know, they were willing to let me play with them. And that's when I got invited to like my first gig officially. Um, and they had this regular gig where they played at the governor's mansion um, a couple times a month generally. Uh, and we would go play for a few hours. Um, I'd get 50 bucks and I'd get uh, a, a meal out of the thing. Uh, and the food there was awesome. It was fantastic food. And that was kind of eye-opening because here was like me doing a thing that I really, really loved. I was only basically working for about two hours is what I saw it. So ninth grade, that, to me, I'm like here doing the math in my head. I was like, oh, that's 25 bucks an hour. Like that's a good rate right, you know, right, right. Uh, for, for a ninth grader. And I'm getting a great meal out of this. This food is amazing. Um, I hadn't quite put it two and two together though until the next summer when I, I worked as a lifeguard because that was like the – that was the summer job that most kids got, which there I got paid like six and a half bucks an hour. So I would work all day at put like out – it's crazy hot. You end up having to clean the bathrooms, which is – they're disgusting by the end of the day. <laughs> and I would make like 48 bucks or something like that for the whole day and I'm like – this is crazy hard. This is not fun at all. Yeah. It's way cooler to play the saxophone for a couple hours and way more fun, get the same amount of money, and you have all this other time to do all this other stuff. Uh, and so that's kind of when it dawned on me, like, you can get paid for the value that you create. Mm. It doesn't have to be about, like, the hours that you sit yeah. in a chair. It's like, if you create enough value and someone's willing to pay you for that value, Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you work one hour or eight hours or 40 hours or 80 hours or whatever it is. Yeah. Like, it's The value is in the eye of the beholder. So if you can do something that's worth that, you should charge a premium for yeah. it. Um, I love that. You get paid for the value you create. Yeah, exactly. And so saxophone was the thing that like I ended up – like that was what – through high school and college, that's – you know gas money, food money, rent money. Like I used that to like, you know, I, I ended up working a lot less than other folks, but still making, you know, similar amounts of money as what other folks were making in their side jobs. Uh, but I was working half the time because yeah. the kids were willing to pay just a little bit more uh, in general. Yeah. Than, well, than and effectively. that's amazing. Yeah. And we'll get into Zapier, but what are the things that you try from a startup or entrepreneurship um, before Zapier, uh, that so, maybe didn't work, or maybe we had a moderate success. Yeah, so I, I, um, it still took me a while before I like, you know, even between that experience playing the saxophone, and it dawned on me that entrepreneurship was really a better route to it. Yeah. Um, I'd had a couple jobs where a lot of times I was just optimizing for my my rate. It's like where can I get like a high you know hourly rate and like low effort spent. So like right. I remember you know, in college having a TA job where I ended up with a professor who I ended – you're supposed to work 10 hours a week because that's how much they pay you for. But he told me, it's like, don't worry. just I only need you to do this one task. So just do that task. The other thing, you can just go sit in the TA's office and if people show up, you can help them. But if they don't, just do whatever. And no one ever showed up to the TA office hours until the – like before finals. Right, right. So I got paid to sit there and work on what I just worked on my homework basically. It's like studied and got stuff I needed to get done. So that's kind of the the jobs I was like I was like where can I double it up a little bit? It's like get paid for two things at once, right? Right. right. Um that's kind of a clever thing that, you know. You always had that efficient mindset. <laughs> which, yeah, right. Which is sort of like what Zapier does, right? Exactly. Because it's you at the time were you trying to automate tasks in your engineering job? Is that how it came about? Yeah, more or less. Um, you know, I, I was an industrial engineering major, which is all about efficiency. Like, it's, you know, the, the, the more common application of that degree is in a manufacturing facility where it's trying to increase throughput, decrease costs, um, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So that you, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, maximize profits right. from that. Um, but it's mostly about cost savings um, generally. And so that that's like been a mindset that I've always had. Like I'm always just like, how can I do this the quickest, easiest way possible, um, and then get the most amount of money from it, um, or at least a good amount, right? Um, anyway, so 
entrepreneurship didn't really hit me until later when um, 2008 market tanks. Um, I'm at the end, near the end of college then, and I start looking for like actual jobs. Not and it's good actually tough to come for, yeah. yeah, tough to come by. Uh, but then I found, so I started getting a little more creative in my my search for like where I should go look for a job. And I found this small software company that was like doing kind of something a little different. And I was like, that's kind of cool. That's like not what I was thinking, but um, maybe I can go work for them. And so I talked my way into a marketing role there thinking mm. like, you know, online marketing has like a lot of this mathematical bent to it. Like you're doing conversion rate optimization and click through ads and things like that. Where sure. I was like, all right, this seems like I can get my brain around this type of work. I'd never done it before, but like, I, I knew enough and I knew how to learn that I was like, I figured I could talk my way through it. So I go take that job and it ends up being like, it's like there's five people, six people working there. This is a startup effectively. I didn't know it at the time, but that's what it was. Um, was they it based like, in Missouri or where were you? It was in yeah. Columbia, Missouri. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and they're trying to sell this, bring this, they're doing product development, trying to sell this product, bring it to the market, all that sort of things. And, um, you know, I, I I started learning all that stuff, and I was like, "Why? Like, we were having a tough time selling it." And I was like, "What kind of is product this? was it?" Um, it was this like, uh, like natural language processing type app that could detect like sentiment and you know sentiment analysis in like text. This uh, sounds and things cutting like edge for like two thousand eight. This is like it was pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Um, they were using it to try it. At, they were using it to sell into the university on campus to Mm. sell um, like an essay grading style software where you Mm. can take templated essays like, you know, prompts and try and like automatically detect themes and facts and stuff like that. Sounds complicated, yeah. Yeah, it was was pretty complicated. Um, And I, I, that was one of the things I learned towards the end is like, this product is too complicated. (laughs) It's like, too inefficient to deliver this at a price point that anyone's willing to pay mm-hmm. and it was too hard to set up was what my initial my eventual conclusion came to but that was after reading things like Steve Blank's Four Steps to the Epiphany Eric Reese's Lean Startup came out around that time um, and learning a lot more about like what it takes to grow a business and that's when I was like all right I'm hooked I want to do this stuff so that's when I started teaming up with um, Brian who was um, one of my co-founders at Zapier, we started playing. Um, and again, I played in his, uh, uh, we had a jazz quartet where I played saxophone. It all goes back to the saxophone. Yeah, yeah. it really does. Right. So I so played he was saxophone. a musician too. He was a bass and guitar player. Oh. And I reached out to him because he was doing a lot of freelancing and, and I wanted to learn how to code. Um, so he was playing, he was doing a lot of Python Django development at the time. So I reached out to him cause I was like, can you help me with some apps? And of course the thing he's interested in with me is, come play saxophone in my quartet. So like that was the trade, right? The saxophone (laughs) is what kind of got me in with him a little bit. Nice. Um, So yeah, so that's, it really does come back to the saxophone. Um, (laughs) um, I want to talk about some of the sacrifices, you know, like when I make the intro, it seems like a breakout success, right? And you and I both know it took a lot of grinding. Oh yeah. To get there. Yeah. Talk about some of the sacrifices early on and even up to today. Um, like when you first yeah. started, what are some of the sacrifices? Well, the biggest sacrifice yeah. out the gate was um, just like every ounce of free time and hobby that yeah. I had. What did um, it look like at that time? Like, What was your schedule looking like with, with When Zapier? we started yeah. Zapier, it's in Missouri. You don't raise outside funding. There's no such thing. So you have to build a business that can just run itself. So I kept my day job at the yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, so did Ryan. So did Mike. And we worked nights and weekends to get this done. So we, yeah. you know, I'd wake up, go to work at 9 a.m. I'd work to like five or six or whatever, mm-hmm. go grab some Chinese food, yeah. uh, then go start working on Zapier. So we would work till, you know, 1 a.m. was like a, like a early stop for us. Mm. Sometimes it would be like 3 a.m., 4 a.m. Wow. To go to sleep. And then for you're a few waking hours. up when? Yeah. You're waking up at, like, I'd wake up at, you know, 8.45 and then like, go to work basically it, like be, try to be a work at nine o'clock uh, <laughs> really, 45 that's I, cutting I, it close it was I you sound like me really close yeah. to the office. Um, i hate commutes so i was like super close to the office i could get there in like three minutes um so i would just like 
quick shower, throw on some clothes, and they had food at the office so I could grab breakfast and stuff at the office. Um, yeah. So how long you know, did it take for you guys to be working nights and weekends to kind of get the first version? Yeah. So I got um, the first version launched in like publicly in May of 2012. We mm-hmm. started in October 2011. So mm-hmm. that's um, about seven months. Yeah. Seven, uh, yeah. I had been working nights and weekends like that for about three months before I went full time on Zapier. I still work nights and weekends, but I was putting my days into it as well, which that that released a little bit of pressure because after um, three months you went. I went three mo- full oh, months. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, um, I talked it over with my wife. She was a teacher, and we were living in a cheap, cheap apartment in Columbia, Missouri. I think rent was like five hundred and twenty-five dollars a month. Oh, I uh, lived in Missouri. I lived in Baldwin. My rent yeah. was like one hundred and twenty a month. Yeah, I had Baldwin, three roommates. Wait, yeah, yeah, so way cheaper. Like I, I'd, I'd actually in college lived in a a, a place where I I was two hundred five a month. So you you know. You know what the rents are like. For sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she had a teacher's salary, so it's like we can we can make ends meet on just her salary. And Zapier had made enough progress that I was willing to take a bet on it and go full time. What and, were you seeing with the progress that you were willing to take that bet? So we were able to get like a couple customers. Um, so uh, in fact, how we met was through Andrew Warner right. Mixer. Well, Andrew was our first customer. Uh, he was the first so, customer. Was the very first yeah. customer in Zapier. So that happened in early December of that year. And um, we had Olark on the site. And so I kept that on sometimes at work. And I would get quite a few chats. Like I would sometimes get three or four or five chats during the day about people asking about using Zapier. And I would be, you know, kind of taking care of it in between tasks at work. Yeah. And realize, like, all right, this is, there's some serious interest in this. Like we can move faster. Uh, if we wanted to. And so that was kind of in my mind what like pushed me to see if we could make it work. Where did the name come from? Uh, like now it seems almost counterintuitive. Like, oh, Zapier, Zap. But like, I mean, what was the, the origin of that? So good question. So Zapier, the very first prototype was built at a startup weekend. Um, and so Brian, Mike and I sat down and I actually had come up with a, the name Snapier, S-N-A-P-I-E-R. Uh, in about five minutes. And the way I did it was yeah. I was like, well, we're doing things on based on APIs. So let's see if we can fit API into the to the name mm. somehow. And I was like, well, I-E-R is a common ending, right? I-E-R. So right. now i got A-P-I-E-R. Ah. Is there a prefix that I can put on that yeah. that is kind of cool and clever? And I was like, well, snap, snap here, right? Uh, you know, you got one piece. So there's a downside. You do everything it. in a snap. Yeah, yeah. That, that could work, yeah. So went and looked up the domain, uh, see if it was available. It was, uh, you know, eight bucks later or whatever it was, nine bucks later, we we were in business. We had the name Snapier. Um, then after the weekend, we did some more research and found a similar company who had Snap in their name. And so we're like, ah, we got to change it. Uh, we didn't want to, like, you know, deal with all that sort of stuff down right. the road. Uh, and so we did another search on IP, APIER and found Zapier. And so that's what we settled I on. I love it. It works. Yeah, it's great. So, you know, wait at the time, you guys are working nights and weekends, um, grinding, right? But you have a wife at the time, I right? do. So yeah. tell me about that because it's really hard to balance. I mean, I know if I'm working late, like I get yelled at um, <laughs> in a nice way. Um, what What's the dynamic there and how do you make yeah. her happy along with just having these other two wives, co-founders that yeah. you're basically spending all your time with? Yeah, I used to um... – I used to joke with Chelsea that it was her fault that I started Zapier and that I, that I ended up working as much as I did because as a teacher, she was she was working just as insane of hours as really? I was. Um, she kind of has that workaholic mentality too where mm-hmm. she would – she'd go you know, to work at like 6 in the morning uh, and then she would be at the office till 10 p.m. or whatever and get home and just you know go to sleep effectively. Yeah. Um, and so – before we started Zapier, she was, you know, that was her first year teaching. And I would come home and I would just like watch Netflix a bunch. And I was like, well, this is not a productive way to spend my time. Um, and so that's when I was like, I got to find a better hobby to do. Mm. And really, that's where I started spending way more time like coding, working on side projects, things like that. 
which what is what led to Zapier. And so it actually wasn't, you know, there was There was no real was friction like, there. Like It wasn't, right? Because she we was both working. Were working yeah. Mm -hmm. And we were both doing what we wanted to do. And every now and then we would take a, a Friday night or a Saturday off and we would spend it together. And, and that worked pretty well for us um, in that first year. Um, the... The friction that the, the tricky part was when later we ended up moving to California and she didn't have a job then mm. and I was still working the crazy amount of hours and now like that's the harder part to deal with is when there's like lopsided schedules. Um, yeah, you weren't we're around and she had things. some free time. Exactly. And exactly. that was for Y Combinator, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And the first time around you got rejected. We did. Right? So we actually applied right out the gate after we started Zapier and got kind of their standard rejection email. Um, How far into Zapier were you when you applied? Two weeks. Three oh, weeks. two weeks. Okay. So it was really yeah. early on. I got yeah, you. It was like right out the gate. Um, you know, I guess we were a little bummed, but we weren't, it wasn't an unexpected outcome, I guess. It mm -hmm. was kind of like a moonshot for us anyway. We're like, well, let's just try it just to see. Yeah. Um, the second time we applied, there was a lot more intention to it. Um, we had made a lot more progress. We had like YC companies using Zapier. So we were like, we can. That's a big testimony. Yeah. It's like, exactly. And we knew like that this product was going to work. Like this company was going to be successful. Um, we just didn't know like how successful or how quickly we we're going to be able to make it work. And we felt like YC could, you know, true to its accelerate name, it could, could accelerate us. Yeah. Uh, and so we would, we, we were a lot more serious with the application the second time around. We also had way more progress too. So like all the stuff in that first application was like, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do this. You know, the second time around the application was we did this. We did that. We did right. this. Here are the results. Much better. Yeah. Right. It's way more convincing when you're trying to vet a person to say like, they're worth taking a bet on when you're like, I achieved this. I achieved that. I achieved this. You're, yeah. You know, everyone's going to bet on the person that already has a couple wins under their belt. And so we had proven, like, not a ton, but enough that it was, you know, I think that's why YC was willing to, to take a bet on us that second time around. So how long into it did you get accepted, and what were the most popular zaps at the time? We had got accepted, I guess it was about six months in. Um, I honestly So pretty early on also. Yeah. I, I honestly don't remember what the most popular – zaps were at the time like i don't even know i'm just wondering what were the most popular early integrations that you, know, you guys did like andrew I, I know you had uh high rise i think and paypal yeah, or i don't remember paypal and high rise i think he was doing like wufu and a, a weber Wufu, as well. yeah so yeah he was doing um i was getting like uh text messages for stripe payments like i loved getting those um mm. we were also loading our customers into mailchimp um, so through Stripe to, to MailChimp, um, I think there was quite a few folks doing stuff with, um, let's see, Gmail was popular. Zendesk was one of those early ones. MailChimp was one of those early ones and SMS. There was a ton of stuff with SMS, just mm -hmm. getting like text alerts and stuff for things, um, was pretty common at the time. So the sacrifices grinding and then picking up and basically moving you and your wife to California yeah. was a big one. Mm -hmm. um, what did you learn in that uh, the Y Combinator experience? Well, talk look about some of the mentors you had and what advice you got during that time. Yeah, you know, YC is interesting. Um, the the mentorship is is good. It's it's great. But honestly, like if you go watch, you know, YC has their startup school now, uh, and if you go watch like those videos, mm -hmm. you're getting like ninety nine percent of the advice that they give you, hmm. uh, like being physically there. It's all there. You just got to, you just got to do it. Right. right. Uh, so it, they publicly put all this stuff out there at the time. It was PG's essays, right? Like he has those essays. It's all there. Like, you know, they're not hiding this stuff. Um, so the thing that YC really gave us, um, and I think I didn't realize this maybe until hindsight was we were grinding nights and weekends, day jobs still happening. Right. They took us away from that environment where Zapier was the secondary goal. They yeah. turned it into the primary yeah, goal. It wasn't the priority completely. Exactly. Yeah. We got three months. 
they put a deadline where you got like this artificial deadline demo day where you've got to do something impressive by demo day so you got to race against the clock right yeah um we moved all the way from missouri to california so away from friends family no other distractions now for us and it's three of us hold up an apartment the yeah. only thing we have to do is zapier now so it became like all encompassing and that sort of that is what makes the acceleration part happen. It's right. like, that's all there is to work on. And they really instill that into you. PG, the very first day, he gets up and says, this summer you should do three things. You should write code, you should talk to users, and you should exercise. Those are the three things you need to do. We exercise the first day, and then the rest of the summer we'll <laughs> we wrote code and talk to users. For 10 minutes we exercised. <laughs> and that the was rest basically of... it. <laughs> You know, because I figure obviously people can go online and watch the stuff, but you're probably having one-to-one -one conversations with some of the mentors. You do have a little bit of that. Yeah. Uh, and, it, you know, it's a lot of it's just repeating what's in that startup school um, it is, and yeah. what's at um, the essays. You know, I remember um, one of the first one was demo, or like office hours was, are you guys launched? Like, do you have a, have a product? And like, we're like, well, we have one. We're not quite launched yet. Like, we're not sure if we're ready. And they were like, what, well, what, you know, why aren't you launched? And it's like, well, we're just not sure. Like, we, you know, like we were, we were doing the circular classic. circular conversation. Yeah. It's like, yeah. we were doing the classic thing. Like, it's not perfect yet. Like, there's a few things we kind of want better. And they were just like, stop it. You're going to launch next week. Mm -hmm. Right. So they, like, they got out like a, a Google doc and they were like writing up a TechCrunch press release for us basically on the spot. So we're like, oh. Yeah. I guess we should just do this right now. So, you know, they, yeah. they took a little of the fear out of us when it came to just doing things before you were ready. Yeah. Um, they held your feet to the fire and held you accountable to make sure you did it. Exactly. Um, and, and that's where the accelerator part comes from. It's like they knew we were ready for this stuff. Like we were just kind of, I don't know if it was fear or what it was, um, perfectionism, you know, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, there was a few things that we just kind of went a little slower than we needed to. Like they just had known based on historical like insight that we just needed to go. Uh, and so they kind of just pushed us to move a little faster than we were probably accustomed to. What was the progress from the beginning of starting to the end? Sure. We, so when we started, Zapier wasn't launched. It was, there was a, a private beta and we went uh, from that to being launched to having about 20 integrations, 20 apps on Zapier to having about 70 on Zapier. Wow, that's crazy. We had no, um, the developer platform didn't exist at all. So the developer platform is now how apps get added to Zapier. Um, our partners add apps to Zapier based on um, the developer platform. We don't typically add them. Um, that didn't exist at the beginning of the summer. Uh, by the end of the summer, it existed. We had 13 people build on the developer So you were, before that, you were doing all of them. Yeah, now we were you were just, giving people the opportunity to do it, so it takes a huge weight off of you. Exactly, yeah. And That's built huge. Something, yeah, I mean, we built something valuable enough, too, that people were willing to invest in our platform, too, um, and build their apps on it as well. Um, was, so, there, yeah, was that a hard big. thing to do to convince that like early on to get those first few people or do you um, remember who those first few companies were that built on I remember it? a handful of them. Yeah. Um, HubSpot did, Active Campaign did, mm -hmm. um, Podio did. Those were three that I can remember. There was another, mm -hmm. you know, 10 or so that did it as well. Um, the way we got them to do it was they had come to us and said, we want to be on Zapier. Yeah. Like it's like a product manager, or a, you know, someone who was in some position of authorities was like, we want to be on Zapier. Can you build on Zapier? And we said, yes, we'd love to have you, but do you think you could help us out with it? We're working on this developer platform. We're building it out and we'll, we'll sit side by side with you and help you build the integration. If you invest in our developer platform. So we kind of were like, you're going to get this special treatment because you're going to be one of the right. first people using this tool. Right. And so we kind of did it side by side with those first 13. Um, and that momentum was enough that I guess, you know, like since then, basically everyone is, uh, you know, has built, built, built on the developer platform. So right now, Wade, 
what percentage of do you build versus the developer platform? On a monthly basis, like we build like one or less, you know, really? and, and the rest about is 25 every month. Yeah, so it's, it's almost a hundred percent. Yeah. Developer. Basic. Uh, wow. the only time that, you know, we build one is like w when we hire someone new, uh, oftentimes we'll ask them to build one as an experience to understand the process Everything and understand what it's like. Yeah, exactly. So how was demo day? Uh, a blur. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was crazy. I like, um, you know, there's hundreds Who, are of three of you there. up there on stage. Just me, just you, just me on the stage. You get two minutes to pitch. You know, we we pitch this thing. Everyone kind of sounds a, a little bit the same because the advice is all. You know, they they polish up everybody's pitches so they all sound great. It's yeah. like you know, Tam is huge. Growth is great. You know, we're changing the world. You know. Uh, <laughs> They all sound similar, but they all sound great, right? Uh, yeah. And I was, you know, firmly in the middle of the pack when it comes to like pitchers at, from you know other YC companies. There's people in our batch that are way better presenters, way more personable and entertaining up on stage. Uh, they could captivate an audience way better than I could. So we were, I felt like we were fairly middle of the pack presentation. Uh, even though now we're probably one of a you know, there's there's a handful of companies from our batch that are maybe better than us. Instacart maybe being the only one that's like clear, a clear runaway. Uh, who are the winner. other companies in your group that you guys uh, spend time with? Because that's valuable too, who the peers are around you at the time. Yeah, so like Instacart was in our batch. Coinbase was in our batch. Um, Daniel Morrill was in the batch with Referly, which is now Mattermark. Um, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Nine gag, clever, boosted board. Like there's a handful of other stuff that you may or may not have yeah. heard of, but are doing interesting stuff in their kind of specific industry right. or niche. Um, but yeah, you get to spend time with some pretty smart folks for sure. So what uh, was good about your pitch that you liked? Do you remember? You have two minutes thing, and you're yeah. raising money. I mean, this is a big moment, right? You're raising money yeah, for the best your company. Had, the best thing we had was this graphic that showed that really – viscerally showed the problem so we put up a bunch of logos of apps that we integrate with yeah and it started with you know like two apps and it showed like here's what it's like to build an integration between just two then we added like five and then it showed like all the lines and connectors between five then we put like 10 up there and it showed all the lines and connectors between all of those and so like the, the graph is like wow to build all the integrations point to point like this between all these different apps is insane like it like once we got to like tw i think we had maybe fit 20 on the slide like it's basically just all dark like there's, <laughs> right. you can't see any white space between any of the lines right so visually like when you see that you're like wow that is a hairy mess and then the the next slide was like here's zapier is the solution and it's our logo right in the middle with all the lines just drawing through us um and it's like wow that is a way smarter way to do things right um is to have kind of a middle thing like that. So that was probably the most compelling piece of our our pitch was just like visually showing visually people. seeing like how what much Zapier simplified the space in this problem just by existing. So what was the response you got from demo? So day? F funny enough, you know, we raised money after demo day. We spent about two and a half weeks doing it. Only one person that we met at demo day invested in our seed round hmm. um, the rest of the people that invest in our seed round were people who had already emailed us prior to demo day and expressed interest in us um, and we told them you know we're not raising money now but we'll be in touch later and so we just circled back to them after demo day and said hey we're looking into it now are you interested and um you know, enough of those were that we were able to put together a million and change That's amazing. in about yeah. two and a half weeks. What were you looking for at the time? In terms of money? Yeah. Was there a we amount like, or? Not, like we were like 500,000 would be fine. 750,000 would be fine. Like we, I mean, we were used to not like operating without. You're bootstrapping. Yeah. Yeah. Used to it. So in our minds, it was like, a little bit of money would have been nice because yeah. then we could have paid ourselves like a small salary, um, maybe hire one or two people. Um, that would have been good. So yeah, what would you 
um, initially when you're like, okay, we want to get this funding, was it for hiring people? What did you want to use it for? It, it literally was put a little money in the bank so we could pay ourselves some salaries so we could exist. Not <laughs> right. worry about you working know, 20 hours a day, paying yourself $5 an hour is still. Yeah. yeah right. Like we wanted to, to, to be able to support ourselves. So, you know, in that regard, you know, if we would have raised, um, you know, living in the Bay Area, if we'd have raised like 200,000, 250,000, that could have paid for the three of us to like live in the Bay Area for a year and a half and make no money. Yeah. So like that was like the baseline of like, okay, that's probably a good start. Mm -hmm. 500,000 lets us hire probably one or two people. Mm -hmm. um, so what did you so do after? Aiming for. And then we had the opportunity to raise more like, and, and we kind of considered not doing it, but then when we talked to YC, they were like, go run the dilution numbers. Just look at the valuation and look at the dilution and see how much you would, you know, get diluted. And we did. And it wasn't very much. And so we were like, well, I guess having the safety net isn't the worst thing in the world. Right. Um, yeah. And so that's what took a little bit more. So who do you hire first? Um, we So we started – the thing that I was doing at the time was spending about – I'd wake up in the morning and from about 8 or 9 o'clock until about 3 p.m., I was asking, answering customer emails. Yeah. So we're like, we need some help on customer support. It's a lot of customer uh, emails, yeah. Yeah, we need some help on customer support. Uh, and you we guys got some have, advice. I have to say, you guys have amazing support. Thank you. I mean, right now. And, and I want to get to pricing because, like, you know, we pay – we have the – the work account and I also yep. have the free account. I feel so bad emailing from the free account because I'm like, I'm taking up the resources. But even on that, there's amazing support. I'm like, I feel guilty even emailing you guys. Um, but anyways, <laughs> go on. Yeah. So, um, we got advice from, uh, in fact, the reason, big reason why we have this great support is from this advice we had from, Kevin Hale, who was um, Wufu founder, he, mm -hmm. he is uh, now a partner at YC. At the time, he wasn't, but um, we got to chatting with him about customer support um, and, and how to think about it. And you know, the very first person he recommended was like to find someone who, you know, is loves just helping people and isn't super like like they're cool that being their thing, right? Like just there's people out there that just love helping people. And if they're not, if they don't, don't worry if they don't have ambitions to be an engineer or a marketing wizard or anything like that, like support is its own entity. Like mm. it doesn't have to be treated like a call center or something like that. There are people who genuinely just love helping other people. Right, right. Find someone who's like that and that's who you want to be your support. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and so that's why I, I thought of my buddy, uh, a guy I, I'd lived with in college for a year, um, as someone to bring on to help us with support because he was running this forum, this Chicago Cubs forum. Uh, oh, really? Is he from he was, Chicago? He, I, I think he lived in Chicago for a, a small period of time. He's from Ohio usually, originally, yeah. but um, he loved the Cubs, and so he moderated this forum that had like – you know, thousands of Cubs fans. And I was like, well, if you can handle dealing with Cubs fans, <laughs> on my internet forum, right. like you can certainly do support for a software app. Right? right. Um, and so I talked to him about joining and, and convinced him to join up with us. Um, and so that was, that was our first investment. But I, I do want to go back to something else, which is yeah. the, the great, um, support that we have at Zapier, which was another piece of advice we got from Kevin Hale at the time. And the way he talks about this is really interesting. You can have – what he told us, you can have – there's three types of companies. There's ones you can have the best product. This is like Apple or Tesla or something like that. It's going to be super high price, but you know you're going to get what you pay for. It's right. really high quality. This is really tough for startups to do because it takes a while to have the best product. Like right. you usually don't have the best product out the gate. Right. Um, the second thing was you can have the cheapest product, right? This is like Walmart, Amazon. Um, this is also really tough for startups to do out the gate because you don't have the economies of scale at play. 
Right. So you're not going to compete on those type two dimensions. But the third type you mentioned was you can have just like the best customer service and create like the best emotional connection with your customers and your brand. Yeah. This is like what Zappos did, right? Right. They didn't do anything novel or unique. They just sold shoes, but they did it in a way that was like the customer service was yeah. really great. They had great refund policies, guarantees that they built a great brand yeah. off it. This is something that any startup can do, right? right? All it requires is just effort. You just need to take the time and just care enough about your customers to do it. And so we really took that to heart when it came to customer service because yeah. we were like, well, let's do that. Like, We may not be the best out the gate. We may not be the cheapest out the gate, but we certainly can make sure that our customers care a lot. And now we've baked it into the to the model now at this point in time, the business model that we know we can give great customer support to free users. Um, so we're willing to do it uh, because we know it pays off for us like that. That investment in our customers gets yeah. returned to us in space. For sure, it's amazing. Yeah, I can yeah. you know firsthand see that. Um, I want to just put a plug. You know, you guys are always constantly hiring, so I want to make sure that we link that up. So if anyone's looking for a job or know someone, yeah, because um, you guys, I think when I read, you have people in nineteen different countries on your staff uh, or something like that. I don't know if it's nineteen. Okay, that's um, I thought I read that. 10. Okay, it's more than ten for sure. Yeah. Um, no, nine. I'm sorry. Nine. Yeah. Nine. Countries. Sorry. Um, I think it's more than 10 now. So, so you could do this for me. So what link should we link up? Um, yeah. Go to the zapier.com slash jobs. We've got roles in, you know, customer. Ch- so if you wanted to help us out with support, if you love customers, we got roles there. We've got engineering roles. Um, we How do you product. decide what, what to hire and when to hire next? So like give That's me an example of what, what you're looking for now. And how do you know it's re- you're ready for that next person? Yeah. So we do a little bit more forecasting now than we used to. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it still comes down to like when do we viscerally feel the pain, right? right? Like yeah. when, like we, we tend to be a little slower in hiring. Some companies are just like we're going to hire way ahead of time so that we know we have the staff. We tend to try and hire a little bit. Feel, like we're, feel the pain a little bit. Yeah. To, the, to the back end of that a bit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, like with support, we know, like, okay, like it's feeling a little tough. We should probably bring in somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, Is there an indicator, like, for the? Because I mean, back then you used to do support, right? You'd wake up yeah. three p.m. So you knew that firsthand. Right now, exactly. there needs to be some kind of feedback mechanism. Do you tell mm-hmm. them, okay, this is what's the feedback mechanism there for well, you? Well, now we have we we have like a lot of we have got you know three or four years of historical growth that we can look at. See. So we know like. Support trails are is closely aligned with our sign up rate. So if our sign up rate keeps moving like it does, that indicates we're going to need customer service reps to help out yeah. with the, the amount of sign ups. Yeah. So it's based on yeah. sign ups. I didn't know if it was like support ticket, like you're seeing X number of support yeah. k- tickets a month. You're like, okay, when we reach this, we need another mm-hmm. person to take that on. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really tightly coupled with the sign-up rate. So we have that. And then from like the product and engineering side, it's more yeah. like are there opportunities that we're missing out on? Like mm-hmm. are there things we're not getting to build because we're yeah. only to, able to build you know a certain amount of stuff? It's a tough one though. So yeah. how do you decide what to build? Or you know, because you, I'm sure you get a million requests. You do get a million requests. And I think for us with – I think I put one in things, the other day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to um, you have to be a little patient and impatient at the same time. Um, so you got to be patient and know that you can't build yeah. everything at once. But you also can't accept that that's good enough. Yeah. You you have to be willing to say, like, that has come up enough. That issue has come up enough. Why yeah. haven't we solved that yet? And if the answer is, yeah. like, we have other more pressing things that to solve, yeah. well, how can you get more staff on board to make that happen? And so that's kind of how we've always approached like the product engineering side mm-hmm. of the things. It's like when we can, we try and invest in it um, to help it grow. So product. talk about, because we'll give a specific example, right? Because you're launching a new Chrome. Yeah, we launched a, a Chrome extension um, a, a couple weeks ago now. So uh, before you talk about that, what pa- what did you pass over to build this? Because obviously... You couldn't build everything. So this will kind of yeah. elicit the point. The Chrome extension is actually interesting yeah. um, in that 
we built this at a retreat. So we do these retreats because we're uh, 100% distributed. So twice a year we do these. And during the retreats, we end up working on about a, a half dozen or so projects. And oftentimes these are our more speculative things. Mm. So the retreats kind of kick off. What's some the retreat? Of the yeah. Tell me about the retreat. They are these two times. We're 100% distributed. So two times a year we fly everyone in the company out to the same location. Um, we, we find somewhere in, you know, in the world that we like to go to and, and we go there. Uh, we spend usually about three days of it as part of is, is a hackathon where it's just kind of like build something. And there's um, like what, how many? Like 50 plus people there. Yeah, our last one was in Whistler, and we had 43 people. Mm. Um, and it was in August. And so part of that, one of the projects was this Chrome extension. Yeah. It was This was an idea that has been on our backlog for forever. It's like, cool idea. No one's like, you know, knocking down the gates to get this. But <laughs> we've seen like enough right. signs that we thought it could be more powerful yeah. than like what. Sometimes the, people don't know what they want. But they don't know. Yeah, yeah. it's exactly. But we there was enough people that did mention this that we were like, there is value here. Mm -hmm. We had seen ourselves using this sort of stuff. Like, I don't know about you, but I'm a Chrome extension power user. I have tons. So I was thinking like, well, if we can make a Chrome extension that kind of works with all the apps on Zapier, it's almost like building a universal Chrome extension for every single app Mm. that exists. Yeah. And so it's like, now you've got this kind of like all-in-one Chrome extension. And it brings Chrome extensions to things that don't necessarily have Chrome extensions yet. Um, pretty compelling story. Pretty compelling use case. So, yeah, talk about the retreat and what did you do with this Chrome So this Chrome one extension. of the teams went, at, went like over the three days built out a version of it. Um, and it started with the simplest thing you can do, which was just click the Chrome extension and you press a button and it fires a zap. So okay. maybe it like sends a text message to, you know, your spouse saying like, I'm leaving work today. So when you're ready to leave work, you just press the button and it fires off that text message, Mm. right? It could be as as simple as that. Uh, It could be more complex. Like maybe you push this button and it runs a script that generates a report and then emails that report to a handful of folks. Um, So like on demand, you know, report generation. It's the the easy button. button. You're creating the easy button. Yeah, it really is the easy button. You know, you just say, you know, generate sales report and it sends the sales report to that's awesome. You know, on a monthly basis or whatever. Right. Um, So that's what it started out as. Then we added they they got that released and they had a little extra time and they added a form block too now. So you can actually, you know, put a little information in it. And then push the button and send that bit of information along as well. So it's customized, uh, sort of. Is exactly. That, it customizes things. Exactly. So now it could be something like uh, make a note to yourself. So you make a little note to yourself and you push the button and it logs it into Evernote. Mm. Uh, or you write a little bit of a information or you put, a, you, you put an email address in there. It spits it through Clearbit finds out all the social profiles, then logs it all into a CRM or something like that. Mm-hmm. So it's like it's got a text field now um, that you can use with the Chrome extension. Uh, they built, got this, other they built this it. all in how much time? Uh, it was three days for the prototype. Then post-retreat, they spent about a week kind of polishing it up and getting it ship ready. Okay. So what's it we, called? Where can people find it? Uh, so you can if, if you go to the Google Chrome store and you look search for push by Zapier, you'll find push. it. Um, yeah. Push by it's Zapier. And easy to find it. Is there a place on your site that you profile it or anything, or is it just on there was, the There was the, a blog post about it uh, yeah. that we launched it um, maybe a, a week or two ago. We don't actually have a landing page for it yet. Um, I think if you go to zapier.com slash zapbook slash push maybe. Right. That exists. Um the easiest uh, is to go obviously uh, on the uh, yeah. Chrome extension. Yeah. The Chrome extension pushed by Zapier. And so what will it do? Like, what's a common use for it that you find? So, um, you know, a lot of it is to like do those types of like on-demand reporting is pretty common. Mm-hmm. You know, click a button, gener- pulls in the report from the last week, emails the report, or dumps a Slack notification for the report. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it could be on demand, like text messaging. So, like text message, common text message that I need to send a person on a weekly or daily basis. Mm. Um, it can be like a quick ad to generate tasks is a common way. So, like quick ad a task to Trello, Asana, Todoist, Wonderlist, that sort of thing. Like quick add them, mm. uh, that sort of stuff. Um, 
because it's just right there. Like anything yeah. that you do, but you want to do it quickly, it's often like a, just a slightly yeah. faster way to do it. Yeah, the possibilities are endless. That's why I love reading through your the information on Zapier is because I'll get ideas for things I should be automating or doing that I had no idea that could even integrate. You know. Yeah. Yeah. For, like the people are productivity masters. They should, you know, if they haven't read through your site in its entirety, they need to go on there. Yeah, it's great. It's one of the fun parts about running it too because I don't know everything that's being done with Zapier. So oftentimes I'll hear from folks doing pretty cool stuff and I'm like, oh, what, wow. Yeah, what's the, the craziest thing you've heard someone automate through Zapier? Uh, well, one of the my favorite things is <laughs> so silly. Um, this guy made like several hundred bucks off this thing too, maybe even more. But after we launched multi-step zaps, he made this kind of joke site and he made two of them. One was called Seinfeld text and one is called Kanye text. And he loaded up a zap with it. Well, it starts with Stripe. So if you pay a certain subscription, it fires, it turns on this zap and you put in someone's phone number and it basically becomes like a message of the day sort of service. Mm -hmm. But for in his case, it's like you do this to your friends and it starts randomly sending you Seinfeld quotes or Kanye quotes. Okay. Like on a, every day or every week or whatever. And the more you pay, the more you can spam them effectively. <laughs> <laughs> so he set up this entire site on a zap like in a day wow. that just over the course of, you know, I think one of them is like you can do it for a month or for three months or for six months. So for six months, you can basically like send a spam Kanye quote to a friend um, and you can pay, you know, I, I forget what he asked, for, like a hundred bucks oh, to do God. that or something. And so he made like a little bit of money doing this thing. Um, but that's the kind of cool things where it's like, wow, I, I would never have thought to build a little app or something like that. that on funny. Yeah. I would definitely do like Tommy boy quotes or something, but, um, <laughs> Yep. <laughs> what about business purpose? What's the the most sophisticated, like smartest uh, integration you've seen? Someone like, wow, that I can't believe what we created can do this. One of the coolest this. ones is from Eileen, who's our user researcher here at Zapier. Mm -hmm. uh, she does a really cool. She has a really cool setup for scheduling user researchers or user interviews. Like, cause she, as part of her job, she does a lot of Skype interviews like this, mm. where she watches people use yeah. um, the software Very to try valuable. and learn. Yeah, trying to learn, like, where is it working well, where is it failing, that sort of thing. Um, but she's got a zap that automates, like, all the scheduling tasks for this. So she uses this service called Calendly. And so when she sends out an email, uh, she says, hey, if you want to book some time and, and help us out with this, please use Calendly. And, you know, you can say, I want to do it at, you know, 10 a.m. Right. Yeah, Eastern. I use Acuity scheduling, same type yeah, of thing. Same, yeah, same same you know, right? Um there's several services like this. Um, so for her, when that Calendly link goes through, when someone schedules it, what it does is it um, sends them, it triggers the zap, it sends them a follow-up email saying like, hey, confirmation, you just got scheduled for this. Um, you know, here's a link to add it to your calendar. It sends a, you know, an email out that puts it in Google Calendar or Outlook or whatever. Um, it then delays until um, a day before the scheduled event so then a day before the event happens it sends an email saying like hey reminder tomorrow we're scheduled to do this are you still on for it uh and then it delays it one more day um and then an hour before the event happens it says hey you're you know ready to do this and uh it sends along a go to webinar or go to meeting link that says you can mm. join the meeting link here which i forgot there's an earlier step that actually inputs that into go to meeting and sets up that stuff and generates the yeah. invite link um and then it sets up the the interview, and then uh, post interview the afterwards it sends another follow up email thanking them and sends like a, a, a link to get a T shirt from us. That's awesome. Um, and it also along the way is dumping notifications into Slack so that the rest of the team has visibility into this, saying like, "Hey, this interview is getting scheduled or it's getting ready to start. If you want to join in and watch along with it, you can come watch along with it." I think it also logs some data into Airtable so that we have kind of an archive of like who this she's is amazing. Talking. Wow, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like it's a pretty sophisticated setup. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, you know she's like really thought through like all the pieces, and so now all she has to do is show up, get the person to interview. just schedule, and that's it. Yeah, and yeah. Show so up. she shows up, conducts the interview, logs her notes, 
Um, but then the automation kind of handles right. all the logistics right. around it. Um, yeah. And people cool. typically probably either have to do that manually or they're not doing it manually and things fall through the cracks. And yep. that's, that's the problem. Yep. yep. So talk about pricing. Yeah, I need to, before we, we end though, I need at some point to hear about what the Chrome extensions you use as a power user. I'm really curious. Um, yeah. But pricing. Yeah. I'm really curious. You have a free plan and uh, the $20, as we're talking now, may change. Who knows? The $20 a <laughs> month plan and on. But I'm curious from the, start with the free plan, the thought process on that. And I'm curious why you, you allow people five zaps and not three zaps or two zaps. I think if, if I were you, I'd be like, no, I'm sorry. Like three zaps, <laughs> like I said, like three is enough. Yeah. How did you come to that or even have a free plan? We didn't have a free plan originally no. um, when we launched. We were just paid. Um, then we realized you know, a lot of the services we do integrate with have free plans. And so free made it easy. And also the partners that we were integrating with, um, it made it easier for them to talk about Zapier if we had a free plan. Uh, so it was a marketing advantage for yeah, us. Yeah. You know, having that free plan made it easier for people to talk about Zapier, share Zapier with other folks, that sort of thing. So that's why we added the yeah. free plan. So on the free plan, uh, how do you decide what to include in the free plan? Gut feel. Like we could probably, I know we could do, you know, you mentioned go from five to three or two. We could do that. We'd make more money. Like almost guaranteed. I mean, I think I say that. Because I think there's a huge value in, in that yep. alone also, you know? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. I think we'd make more money guaranteed. But I just, did I didn't that. know if there was a reason for that number. Like you saw users or it just was a gut feel type of thing. It's a lot of gut feel. We've done some testing on it. It's like a good amount that allows people to try that product and get kind of hooked on it. Yeah. Uh, and to do some stuff for you know, they might have one zap that's for serious work. They might have one that's for maybe more play right. type thing. So right. they can kind of get a feel for it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I say that, you know, way because I like paying for those services because I know yep. you're going to improve the product. So, mm -hmm. you know, I knew like when I use a free, I'm like, eventually I'm going to be paying a monthly fee because I want to make sure you're sustainable and you have the yep. support and everything. So it comes from a, a place of, okay, if you had like three zaps, so I can like, once I become more of a power user, like I'm fine paying whatever that is. So that's why I was yeah. curious about that too. And I think most people, maybe not all, but a lot of people who are running serious businesses that are making like, you know, once they've reached a threshold where they have like one person on staff, they realize like the amount of money they pay for software is like trivial for what they pay right. that person in salary. Right. So I think for the most part, you know, once you get to that serious business sort of stage, like paying yeah. for stuff is like pretty common. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of users, though, that are like freelancers, contractors, and that free plan really helps kind of – it really is marketing it is the way I think about it. It's mm -hmm. like having a little bit of a generous free plan just gets that word of mouth kind of kick-started. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a lot more science to go behind that to say like, you know, we should make it 10 zaps or maybe we should make it one zap or whatever. You know, we've done a little yeah. – like I said, we've done a little testing, yeah. but it just feels right. Like right it right. feels like a good spot right now. Um, so what about, okay, so now you mm -hmm. go to the next, next plan, which is the paid. Yep. So how do you decide on that pricing and, and what's included? So that one was a little bit more scientific. Yeah. Um, cause we have messed around it, you know, it used to be $15. Now it's $20. Um, we just found that, you know, when we moved it to $20, the conversion rates didn't change at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. The uh, so we were dealing with the the same number of customers making a little bit more money it allowed us to invest yeah, more in the makes product. Makes a big difference, yeah. Better. We were able to grow a little bit faster to do more things and build better stuff. So if the price didn't care, our users clearly didn't care that it was twenty dollars versus fifteen. Mm -hmm. So it was better for us as a business to charge twenty dollars. Yeah, make a little bit more money, and then pour that into making Zapier better. Yeah. Um, and so that's really why we moved it up to 20. Uh, yeah. Is there a plan beyond beyond that? There's a $50 plan too. There's a $100 plan. Um, you know, we do have some power users. We're, we don't, 
we don't have like a real enterprise sort of thing yet. Um, yeah. But we've been talking with some other companies, so we're like think finding ways that. What's you know, the hundred dollar plan? Like, what do people use the hundred dollar plan for? You can just get like a lot of stuff, basically. Um, like like a what lot type of companies? Tasks, what type of companies yeah. use it? It tends to be folks who are using Zapier for like more infrastructure type stuff. So they're like, you know, auto generating tons of mass emails to users as they sign up, or mm-hmm. they're like um, logging things into MySQL databases and things like that. They're yeah. doing like, or maybe like a marketing org that's got like a pretty heavy lead gen set up yeah. where they've got, you know, tons of leads coming through the site. They're funneling those into CRMs and email marketing tools and notifications to drive like a pretty sophisticated sales funnel. Um, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yo, wait, this has been amazing. I have, I have one last set of questions I always ask. Yeah. Um, and then I want you to point people towards wherever we're going to point people towards. If it's zapier.com or go to zapier.com backslash blog, you know, jobs. Um, yeah. But since it's inspired inside, I always ask what's been the lowest point and then how you push through <laughs> and then what's yeah. been the proudest moment. Yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, the toughest part and, um, you know, you and I have talked about this before is in, in 2012, my, my father unexpectedly passed away Right. and that's tough. Um, you know, I, I've got hindsight, you know, now three years and, and, and I've been able to, you know, come to terms on what that's like living with, you know, with not having him around anymore. But right. at the time, like he was the guy that I went to for everything. Like when I have a tough spot, you pick up a call and call dad. Right. Um, right. And, uh, you know, that was, you know, Zapier wasn't, you know, wasn't clear that it was going to be amazing success. Like we were still struggling to get things done and make progress and all that sort of thing. So yeah. I, it was like, it was really tough, like losing him kind of right there at the beginning. Yeah. Um, but you know, we were able to push through and, and, and now I can think back fondly and I remember a lot of his lessons that he shared and yeah. stuff. Like what? Like what were that. some of the things that you know? I you think remember? the thing that I remember most from him is just the way that he treated people. Um, you know, he always would go out of his way to like help somebody out or do something nice for them or try and help support them in whatever they were doing. Right. Uh, and so he made a lot more friends that way, and he had a lot of people. I, I remember at like the you know the the kind of the week after he passed away, like people would just come out of the road works telling stories of all the stuff he'd done for mm. folks. I had no idea. Like That's I just amazing. was like totally clueless to these things that he'd done. Yeah. Um. And so it was like, wow. Like that's really how you build up. You know. I think he just did it because that's the kind of person he was. But right. like, um, you can build up. You know people that are going to be there for you when you need it most by just treating them really well yeah so i think that was big lessons i learned from him for sure yeah 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 it's a tough to go through at any point in life especially with all the chaos and everything else that you yeah yeah, it's not easy for anyone um that's for sure whether you're starting a company or not starting a company it doesn't matter who you are like losing people close to you sucks (laughs) Do you yep. take time off at that time or how do you deal with it? Um, because things are such weighed on your shoulders because if you stop working, it doesn't get built, right? It's not like you have a government job where you can leave and maybe <laughs> you know take a few days off and still be getting paid at the time. Things are yep. only happen when you are there to make them happen. I was pretty lucky. You know, I had two good co-founders and, and we had Micah at the time. So it was a team of four of us and, and they were able to you cover a lot slack. of the things, yeah. um, pick up slack. We, we weren't operating quite at the scale we are today either. So, um, you know, me being unavailable for like a few weeks was not the end of the world. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it ended up being the nice thing about it was I could work part time a little bit. So, like you that was flexibility. helpful, right? Like I was back in Missouri when that happened and I was able to like do two hours this day or four hours that day or whatever. Um, so I could keep the ball moving mm. even if it was less than what I was accustomed to. Yeah. 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 Thanks for sharing that. It's, that's such a tough thing to go through and yeah. I'm sure people, you know, have gone through that. Uh, we're listening. Um, what about proudest? Wow. Um, um proudest moment you know there's so many things that um 
are are like that make you proud. I, I think you know the thing that's really exciting for us is those. You know, I talked about the retreats that we do. Yeah, we do those twice a year. Every retreat is really cool because because we work remotely, you don't always visually get to see like all the people that are contributing to this. Like you don't you know that it's happening, but you don't see it, right? Yeah. But those retreats, we get to see all you know in this last one, forty three yeah, people come amazing. together, all in the same room you know, from various different walks of life from all over the world. Uh, and you're like, these 43 people, like we've been able to build something pretty special at Zapier. And you're also just, I'm just incredibly thankful that they spend their days helping me out on the thing that I, you know, I love. Um, so it's just like, you feel proud and thankful and humble and all those things. What's um, I'm sure you do obviously the hackathon, but you do probably team break, you know, exercises. What's a breakthrough, like a team breakthrough, a company breakthrough that came from just being together? I don't know if you do any um, special, you know, exercises or activities with the, with the team and what's come out of it. You know, we talk a lot about, um, we do a lot of round tables, like share experiences and, you know, tackle that sorts of stuff. A lot of the, you know, Hackathon projects are like the best stuff because it's, you know, the first inspiration for something that eventually is going to become, might become a key part of Zapier. Yeah. Uh, so I mentioned the Chrome push extension, but we also have, have a hint, like a whole Yeah, what are some of, of the other breakthroughs that so came? like, if you go look at a lot of our built-in apps, they were started at retreats. So we've hmm. got the formatter, we've got digest, we've got delays, we've got storage, um, We've got a weather app, like all these kind of built-in utilities as part of Zapier are have, I think most of them have started at a retreat, mm. um, which wow. is pretty cool. Um, yeah, and it's also just a good time. I th- you know, we treat it as just a good time to reflect and and just hang out with each other and just enjoy yeah. kind of the last you know six months accomplishments. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what we use it for. Wade, this has been super valuable. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Um, people should obviously check out Zapier, Z-A-P-I-E-R.com. Where else yep. should they go to check out on your site that would be valuable? Yeah, so if you're, um, you know, we've talked to, you know, the, Zapier.com is a place to check out for Zapier. Zapier.com slash Zapbook shows all the integrations we have. Definitely check out the blog, too, if you're interested in productivity, how to use apps. Um, Jeremy mentioned that earlier. And if you're interested in work, if you think this has been cool enough, like, and you want to join Zapier, check out jobs, zapier.com slash jobs. Like, we're hiring, bring on more folks to the team. Is there Uh, um, a job that's uh, typically common that you're always looking for people? Yeah. You know, we're pretty much always looking for help on our um, customer support, and we're pretty much always looking for engineering help. So if, if that kind of matches your background, mm-hmm. um, you know, we pretty much always have a spot for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Chrome extensions, last question, Chrome extensions, I need to know what do you use oh, yes. as a power user? Let's see. Um, you know, LastPass, I'm a big LastPass user. Huge. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you block, so ad blocking, like I just can't stand, like, most sites these days with the amount of ads they have. Obviously, uh, push by Zapier goes without saying, but we'll say it. Yeah. Yep, it is. Um, I've got push bullet, uh, which is a pretty cool extension that allows me to push, um, you know, files and URLs and stuff between my phone and my machine. Mm. Um, so I like that. I use Buffer for tweeting. I have Printfection's Chrome extension installed, which lets me quick generate a T-shirt link. So if I want to send someone a link where they can re- get a Zapier T-shirt, uh, <laughs> that's cool. I have that installed. What else do I? Have? Man, I have a couple other ones up here that I. Oh, ha! Huh. I've got one that's. Um, it's like a what's it called? Oh, Display Anchors. It's called like Anchors Away or something, which shows all the anchors on a site where mm. you can link directly to that spot on a page. Uh, which is nice for really long pages. Mm. Um, sometimes you want to link a specific to a specific spot, so that display right. anchors one lets me get a link to the exact spot on wow. that page. That's uh, awesome. I have a like full browser screenshot um, flip shot that takes a screenshot of like the whole, uh, the whole page, screen. so you don't you know have to scroll, take screenshot, scroll, take another screenshot. Uh, very efficient. You're very efficient. <laughs> you know, I got a whole bunch of stuff. I got a. One, I have one tab, so it collapses all my tabs into one tab because oftentimes I get too many tabs open. Guilty. Uh, yeah. yeah. 
So there's a handful. There's more that I use, but those are some of the most common Thank ones. you, Wade. I really appreciate it. It's always fantastic catching up. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. I appreciate you having me on the show. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out.